¿Qué tal? Muy buenas tardes. Eh, muy buenas tardes tengan todos, amigos y miembros de la comunidad del ITAM. Eh, les doy la más cordial bienvenida a este segundo panel en vivo que hacemos eh, ante la emergencia por la que estamos viviendo. Desde luego, la, la emergencia que vivimos nos ha llevado a preguntas, como fue la semana pasada, bueno, hace dos semanas, en torno a la situación macroeconómica. Y estaremos respondiendo otras preguntas en los, en los días que vienen. Pero lo que también es evidente es que esta, esta situación que hemos vivido nos ha llevado a cuestionarnos una situación en la que vive el mundo, en aspectos eh, muy serios geopolíticos, eh, en donde es evidente que las democracias enfrentan desafíos, donde eh, los gobiernos han dado pie a medidas autoritarias y totalitarias, limitando, restringiendo las libertades individuales. Y donde también vemos que algunos esquemas que han sido de gran beneficio para la humanidad, como son la globalización, el comercio, también pueden verse amenazados ante regionalismos y localismos, producto del miedo que sugiere eh, y que surge de, de una experiencia como esta. Eh, hoy tenemos el enorme privilegio para hablar de estos temas, de contar eh, sin duda con quien es uno de los, en mi opinión, los más grandes pensadores y más agudos pensadores en temas eh, de geopolítica, que es Alan Stoga. Alan Stoga es un estratega, un emprendedor, con una enorme experiencia en comunicaciones, relaciones públicas, consultoría corporativa, medios digitales, geopolítica, banca, gobierno. Y actualmente es el uh, presidente de la Fundación Talberg, una fundación eh, que promueve el, uh, el liderazgo entre, entre miembros de la sociedad civil, y en general a cuestionarnos eh, preguntas sobre el mundo que esperamos para el siglo XXI, a generar diálogo, a generar debate. Así que es un es una gran privilegio, como decía, para nosotros, todos nosotros poder escuchar y compartir los puntos de vista que Alan tiene sobre estos puntos. Alan es también presidente de SEMA Communications y debo decir que fue director general de Kissinger Associates por muchos años, eh, así como de compañías de banca de inversión, tenido roles muy importantes eh, en instituciones financieras y como eh, eh, economista en jefe de la Comisión Bipartisana que fundada el presidente Reagan en temas eh, de América Central. Así que, Alan, it's a pleasure to having you with us. It's really a privilege. Thank you very, very much for being with us. Eh, también le quiero dar la bienvenida y me siento con un enorme gusto de que para conducir esta conversación nos acompañe un viejo amigo, colega, el profesor César Martinelli, que por, por muchos años fue profesor del ITAM, director de su división de Economía, Derecho y Ciencias Sociales, y es hoy en día eh, profesor de la Universidad George Mason. Eh, César es eh, fellow de la Econometric Society y de Economic Theory, y es sin duda, en mi opinión, uno de los más grandes teóricos liberales eh, que existen hoy en día. Así que, César, eh, qué gusto tenerte con nosotros. So, uh, gentlemen, if, if it's okay with you, I would uh, propose that I stay here in the background while I let you two uh, talk about these important issues. And perhaps every now and then I, 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 would, I would just uh, pop in. If, if I may, I should tell our, our audience something important, two things which are important. And let me say this in Spanish. Primero, eh, la Fundación Talbert conduce anualmente y otorga premios al liderazgo internacional, en donde líderes de la sociedad civil, artistas, cineastas, empresarios, eh, académicos, eh, científicos, eh, se distinguen por su importante labor de toda una vida y otorga un premio de un enorme prestigio. El ITAM fue favorecido hace dos años siendo anfitrión de la entrega de este premio. Y precisamente este viernes, uno de los primeros fechas límite para postular candidatos. De manera que Alan habrá, hablará seguramente con mayor extensión de esto, pero queremos aprovechar la, la oportunidad para invitar a todos. Distribuimos información sobre el premio eh, Talberg Eliasson. Y esperamos que eh, pues muchos de ustedes se encuentren líderes en, en, en nuestra comunidad que consideren deben ser propuestos para este premio. Eh, el segundo punto que quiero mencionarles es que vamos a hacer algo un poco interactivo en esta conferencia eh, y a lo largo, eh, eh, les vamos a presentar a través de nuestro chat una, una encuesta a través de SurveyMonkey sobre aspectos que tienen que ver con la confianza en las autoridades, con la percepción que tenemos como individuos sobre la democracia. Nos ayudará mucho que la vayan respondiendo 
y utilizaremos estos mismos resultados. Alan los utilizará como parte de sus comentarios. Okay? So, well, that said, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you, Alan. You're welcome. Hi. Um... Uh, Alan, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for, for being with us. And um, I want to, 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 to start asking you, or start a conversation asking you how you feel about um, um, uh, the statement that in the current situation we have had a, a, like a, a failure of our governance institutions at all levels, not only global institutions, but, but also uh, national institutions and local um, uh, as a result of the current uh, health crisis, but perhaps um, it, this is a, a situation that a, a situation of crisis that pre-existed. Perhaps what the crisis has done is to um, put manif make manifest the shortcomings in the way we govern ourselves. Um, I, I, I want to get a, a bit of your feeling about this. Uh, how, how can uh, we repair this? How can we start repairing this? Well, let's start with a couple of things. First, uh, with a thank you. I want to thank um, Arturo, Alejandro. I want to thank uh, Itam. Uh, it is a relationship, both a personal relationship that I have with uh, the institution and your leadership. Um, as well as Telberg. We had a fabulous time uh, when, we, when we were in Mexico. Uh, I'm a friend of Mexico for many years, and I'm a friend of Etoms. You are truly one of the great institutions of learning in the Americas. Uh, that's the good news, and that's probably the last bit of good news we're going to have for the next hour. So um, I think the point of departure has to be this. We knew that global governance was weak. We knew that democracies were fragile. We knew that economies were, hadn't really recovered well from the, the great, so-called Great Recession of 2008, 2010. Uh, we knew that we were losing control, if we ever had control, of how economies function. There was some reason why interest rates were stuck at zero for, for years and years. Monetary policy doesn't work anymore. Uh, fiscal policy is, in the United States, before this crisis, we were already running a deficit of a trillion dollars. Um, it was Alice in Wonderland time, uh, and, and, and where you have gone down the rabbit hole, and nothing's working the way that it, it, it used to work. As you suggest, the surprise isn't all of what I just said. The surprise is how fragile, how impotent policy is, how uncoordinated policymakers are how broken all of the connections that used to make the global economy and global governance work. Uh, we're how far into this, pick your starting date. The Security Council of the United Nations has counted had one meeting uh, on, on the entire subject, and that was only in passing. And that was because it was a little embarrassing that prior to that one meeting, they'd had no meetings. Uh, we are seeing everywhere, certainly in my country, the United States, certainly throughout the Americas, throughout Europe, we're seeing a rolling failure of government, a rolling fa failure of leadership. Um, and one, frankly, that I think we're near the beginning than the end. Uh, the underlying health crisis clearly is in its early moments. Uh, if you want to be an optimist, you will be hoping for a vaccine in 12 to 18 to 24 months. I would point out that HIV AIDS still has no vaccine, and we're now into 20 years looking for a vaccine. We have medical interventions, uh, medicines, uh, but those took a long time to develop. So in terms of an end game on the science side, doesn't seem that we're very close. Uh, that said, governments, and we can talk about the US, we can talk about Mexico specifically, whatever you want to talk about, Governments are reacting as though this is the end of the world as we know it. We have seen an unprecedented concentration of authority uh, in Washington, in Berlin, in Brussels, in, in Beijing. Governments have, either because they need to or because they want to, have sucked up power and authority, in most cases not doing much with it. 
we have a perfect example is Korea, which just had a presidential election uh, yesterday. Uh, and the president won overwhelmingly because he solved the problem, although I guarantee you it isn't solved in Korea. Uh, but one of the ways he solved it was by a dramatic intervention in personal liberty and personal security, uh, personal privacy rather. Um, in, in, in Moscow yesterday, people woke up to discover that to get on the metro, they had to have a QR code on their phone. And that QR code, which they hadn't known about until they got up that morning, would allow them to stand in a very long line, no social distancing there, and maybe get out on the metro because the government was deciding who was going to work that day and who wasn't going to work that day. And, and, and that story goes on. Uh, how all of this shakes out, what the consequences are, uh, what the big issues, in fact, are, we can talk about over the next, over the next bit of time. And how, I mean, some people, I mean, you have gone over this a bit and, and uh, uh, to some extent, the current crisis has led to an uh, increased demand for, you know, uh, uh, an active role of the government and, uh, and a temporary, at least temporary, or hopefully temporary, uh, reduction of the space for civil liberties. But what we are starting to see in many places around the world is a kind of demand for more authoritarian solutions, as if people are willing to put up with less democracy. Um, so to me, that's kind of worrisome. It reminds us of history. History is, is what, what we have here to, to, to look at. And so we have been in this current, in this type of situation before when a, a crisis lead to societies sometimes opting for, for authoritarian uh, solutions. So how do we counter that and how can how can we build a kind of democratic leadership for these ugly times? And how can we show that democracy can do better than, than, than uh, uh, authoritarian regime? And this, all over the world, I see these calls for closing Congress has just happened in the US yesterday. Talk about, uh, uh, um, you know, um, passing, uh, uh, closing the Congress temporarily for, for making appointments. Uh, there's talk about that in, my, in different places in the world. So uh, suspension of elections, etc. How how do we counter this? Um, I think the point of departure here has to be how bad a situation is this? Uh, President Macron gave a speech a couple weeks ago in which he said, we're at war. And he used a, a, a whole war metaphor. And other leaders have said the same thing. And in wartime, one of the things that happens is civil liberties tend to disappear. Uh, in the United States in the 30s, during the Great Depression, uh, and into the World War II, uh, President Roosevelt, who's widely viewed by history as a great uh, president, uh, a great uh, a man who had done a lot for democracy, for human rights, suspended a lot of civil rights during the war because you have to fight a war, civil rights become less important. Human rights become less important. So the first question is, are, are, are we in a situation that justifies that kind of extreme behavior? The second question is, if we are, how confident are we that governments will give back uh, the, the liberties that they're, they're taking away in the name of our safety and our health? And one of the problems we see through history is that quite typically, once a government has pulled liberty from you, they're sort of reluctant to, to, to give it back. Uh, the third point I'd make is, is the one, how do, what do we do about this? Uh, I was in a meeting this morning, a Telberg Foundation seminar, exactly on that subject, on democracy and its future. And a central banker um, who is one of the wiser men I know, great experience, said, look, when you come to this question of autocracy versus democracy, forget the theories. The real question is process versus outcome. Are the democracies, he asked, producing good outcomes? Put it differently. Are they producing better outcomes than other forms of government at the moment? Uh, and the answer, frankly, in my country has been for some time that 
my democracy is failing too many Americans. I would argue Donald Trump is president exactly because of that. Um, we haven't had, the middle class in this country is being badly squeezed. Real wages haven't increased in 20 years. Um, we have uh, a dramatic rise in deaths of despair long before COVID was here. If governments don't deliver on their social contract, and that's true in every government I know, people are gonna say, let's change government. Let's change perhaps this government, or perhaps let's change the form of government. Uh, so we're at a moment, I think, of testing and of trial. If we fail, if our democracies fail us, um, those democracies will fail. We've seen throughout Latin America for years now, uh, you saw it in Chile last year, you saw it in Peru last year, you saw it in Argentina constantly. If you ask people in polls, democracy or a strong man, air quotes around strong man, majorities consistently have been saying for years, as you know, Cesar, they've been saying, yeah. this democracy yeah. stuff is interesting, yeah. but give me someone who will actually deliver what I need delivered so I can have peace and prosperity. To go to your original question, I think what we're gonna see, not just in the next weeks, but in the next months and perhaps a couple of years, if our systems and governments fail to deliver, uh, I think we're gonna see radical change. I wanted to continue this uh, on this point. Um, there has been, uh, and this is a common situation to, to, to Mexico and the US, uh, uh, kind of a, 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 a gap between different parts of public opinion uh, that has made democratic governance harder. Uh, I talked to, to many of my friends in the US and, and uh, they, they tend to talk to people who think like them. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, same thing happened with when I talked to friends in, in say in Mexico or in my home country in Peru. So there, there is a split in, in public opinion uh, that has led to po political polarization and, uh, and governments that do not feel uh, uh, for, for everyone or for most everyone to be consensual, but that seem to be representing extreme viewpoints. That's, that's not general uh, everywhere, but it's certainly the case in Mexico and the US, the public opinion is, is divided. And so, so this is a, a problem if we want to, to build a, um, uh, leadership to, 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 to reconstruct our governance institutions. So how do we bridge this, this, this gap between, between the different parts of the country? Yeah. I think there's at least two big problems. The first is technology. Uh, we, this is it's more true in my country than in your country, but it's also true in, in, in Mexico. Uh, polarization is partly a function of the technology through which most people get their information. Uh, when I was growing up in the United States and my country was fighting a war in Vietnam, uh, it turned unpopular in the 60s and 70s, not on campuses, but among the general population. Uh, after the Tet Offensive, when Walter Cronkite, who was the big name in television, we only had three networks then, as, as you did, but this guy was the evening news, six o'clock in the evening, everybody in the nation watched him. And after the Tet Offensive, he came back and said, we're losing this war, it cannot be won. And you can see it in the numbers. It wasn't the protests on the campuses, it was the shift in the middle class, because they all got their news. They, they, we shared a narrative as a nation. And that narrative was filtered through a relatively small number of, of media personalities, of news channels, of newspapers. Uh, fast forward to 2020. Um, there are no filters. Almost no one shares the same narrative anymore. And that's because we can construct our own narratives because of how the media in general and social media in particular uh, work. That's true in our countries, it's true throughout Europe. So you've, lo you've lost one of the real glues of societies, that, that, that shared narrative. It is extremely unusual for large, no and, and so you get this sorting. You get this partisanship that sorts, it sorts around income, it sorts around 
uh, ideology. It starts on all sorts of things different in different countries. Um, and that leads to the second problem. Politicians in the good old days, certainly in the United States, actually thought they had to win, to, to become president, they obviously had to get the most number of votes, although we don't do that anymore. Um, they not only had the most number of votes, but they were interested in governing. And to govern, they, had to, they knew they would have to govern from the center because that's how the institutions function best. Media, social media, the process of getting elected has changed that calculus. No one in their right mind now runs in a democracy for the center. They run for the extremes. And they run for the extremes because they, they always knew they didn't need 80% of the vote. They needed 50 plus percent plus one vote. Now you can govern that way. Uh, in, in the old days, you couldn't or you think you can govern that way. So we've gone from a highly partisan political process to, and highly partisan uh, information gathering process to what's become a highly, highly partisan governing process. What everyone thinks of Donald Trump, uh, he has zero incentive as a politician to govern from the center. He's not governing for 100% of the people, and he would tell you he's not governing for 100% of the people. He's governing for his base. I think the exact same thing is true in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I think the president of Mexico is governing for his base because, and that's true in every country I know. It's true in Brazil, it's true in Italy, it's true throughout Europe. You don't run for the center, you don't govern for the center. Now, whether that is, I'm laying, I think, probably too much on the back of technology. It is certainly the bleaching out of our moral codes. Um, it's the loss of ethics in decision making. I think it's a profound failure of many of our institutional, our, our educational institutions. I don't think we integrate ethics into curricula uh, in the way that we ought to, and not just in business or in the law, but in everything. Uh, so as we've lost that ethical filter, uh, why would a politician be any more ethical than anybody else? Um, her job or his job is to get elected, and that's what they're going to try to do. Let me let me ask you in that line um, something you can say about one can that can be said about uh, politicians, uh, like Trump or Obrador in Mexico, or several other cases, Bolsonaro. Say they are whatever we think we think about their policies. Uh, they are great communicators. They have been able to exploit. Uh, the new the opportunities created by 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 new media. Um, how do we how do we turn this uh, this um, this um, kind of uh, problems created by by the new media into an opportunity? So how do we that, that this is perhaps a way we have to we may start thinking about this as, a, as an opportunity to use the new yeah. First, I'm going to say something that is almost certainly heretical um, in any time. Um, I am not a fan of, but I admire Lopez Obrador as president and as a politician. Mexico is a country where the social contract for the majority of Mexicans has failed badly. Um, I, I'm a deep friend of Mexico. I have no choice because you, you have to be a deep friend of your neighbor or you're in trouble, but I love Mexico. But nonetheless, most people in Mexico clearly have not benefited from the last 20 years of my friends in power, my friends making the kinds of economic policies that I would make if I had been in power, because I very much come out of that neoliberal tradition. Uh, but it didn't produce an absolute terms, nor really in relative terms for, you tell me what percentage of the population, but there is some reason that Lopez Obrador won the way he won and why his popularity today continues the way it continues. Um, I have not a single friend in Mexico who voted for him. I have not a single friend in Mexico that I know of anyways that thinks he is, uh, that thinks he's anything but taking Mexico in an awful direction. Not my vote, not my choice, not, doesn't matter what I think. But somehow 50 to 60% of Mexicans still think he's done. Now, it could just be that he's a great communicator, and he is a great communicator. It's also possible that the model that predated 
Lopez Obrador wasn't delivering for that, call it 50%. That is the case in the United States. Donald Trump, who on any measure of being a president, um, is not going to score well in the history books. Let's, let, let's, let's, be, let's be politically correct here. Uh, he's an awful president. He has failed systematically. He's debased the office. Um, he's debased the cabinet. Um, one of my measures of, of judging governments is would I hire anyone in the cabinet to work for me? Um, over the years, by the way, Mexico, they, 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 you've had lots of people in your cabinets that anyone on the planet would hire. There's not a single person in the U.S. cabinet right now that any businessman I know anywhere in the world would say, I want him on my team. You can't run a great country without great people. This government's a disaster. But his popularity among registered Republicans is at the moment 93%. Uh, his global popularity is not changed. It's more or less in the upper 40s. It's more or less what it was the day that he won his, his, his election. Why is that? Because they believe that the status quo ante wasn't delivering for them. Uh, and they have good reason to believe that. So the challenge of democracy is to figure out how do we make the social contract between a majority of the people and our governments function again. And if we don't do that, and, and I know very few countries where that's happening, we will lose democracy. I want to, to mention a point here related to uh, this uh, kind, kind of uh, failure of, of the economic uh, model for many, for many people. Um, so partly this is due to technology as well. So we can think of widening income inequality as a result in part of technological reasons. Uh, it's not only um, 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 there is sort of policy uh, decisions or wrong policies. Maybe in, in part is a result of growth and and and, um, and and technology. How do we? So so that's a tough question in the end. How how do we uh, make the economy work uh, for everyone? And, uh, I, I know it, and just as a question, as a possibility, is that perhaps. Uh, uh, there, there is some room in the sense of uh, that we need more competition, and partly the reason why uh, economy the economy has not delivered for many people, uh, certainly thinking about Mexico, but, but also about the U.S. is a lack of competition, perhaps. Imagine designing a technology which becomes ubiquitous, literally everyone, certainly everyone in this room. Uh, has a cell phone in their pocket. They're on the internet by definition because that's how we talk to them. Uh, they use apps. They use Google. They use and and imagine that this global technology we we is more or less unregulated and is designed primarily to sell things. It is it, the whole logarithms underlying the search engines are advertising logarithms. Um, now, if you sit in 2020 and say, that's probably a strange way to organize the world, to let advertising be the driver of the single most powerful communications technology ever designed, um, and leave it entirely unregulated in the private sector and allow massive concentration, whether the big Chinese companies or the big American companies, uh, and if you were running a public policy school, as, as, as you guys do, you'd say, nah, nobody would do that. That would make no sense. Who would do that? That's why we have governments. But to your point about regulation, yeah, we have seen a systematic deregulation in the, in, in the, in for, for perhaps good reason, but we didn't even bother regulating the new technologies. Now, think about genetics. Think about all of the disruptive technologies that are, that are being worked on at the moment. Um, so we had an example two years ago in China of a Chinese scientist who stood up and said, I have successfully cloned human twins. Um, and the world said, you did what? And the 
truth is that a bunch of people are working on exactly the same project, but they're a little smarter than this guy that he, they didn't raise their hand and say, oh, by the way, I'm messing around with human beings and their, and their genetics. Um, and in fact, his explanation was that the gene that I manipulated was designed to make sure that these kids don't grow up with HIV AIDS. Turned out subsequent information, it was actually their memory genes that he was mostly working on in an effort to try to develop super memories. Um, now, any moral, any ethical person would say, you gotta be kidding. But the entire field of genetics is, is, is not regulated. I was in a laboratory recently on a Telberg event and um, with one of the leading neuroscientists in the world, who is a Telberg uh, Eliasson uh, prize winner, and he was explaining a, an experiment, not an experiment, it's actually an early product developed that Facebook is working on that will allow us to type by thinking. And their goal is 100 words a minute, which is faster than I can type uh, with, with my fingers. But type by thinking. Um, now that sounds terrific. Wow, you could just sit here and think and suddenly words are appearing. And it turns out, however, that that technology probably is a two-way flow technology. That is to say, if you can tell that computer to type faster, it can indeed impart in you other thoughts. It can read your mind. It can literally change your mind because it can change the nature of, of, of thought in the way that it interacts with it. None of that's regulated. So yes, we have a huge regulatory problem most of them aren't even being considered by, by governments, neither yours nor mine. They're just being left to the magic of the marketplace. In a way, um, something that makes difficult, uh, uh, you know, uh, picking up these challenges is the total loss of, uh, total loss of trust uh, in experts, in expert knowledge. There used to be uh, at some point, I mean, we, we, we have many problems in the past in the political and economic model, but we have some notion of authority that seems to have been lost. And uh, there is mistrust in experts in every possible uh, field because of a situation in which pe people or big chunks of the people suspect the news, suspect the... So, so that is going to make very hard to, to uh, deliver the changes in regulation or changes in policies that, that seem to be needed. How do we rebuild that trust in, uh, in, in yeah. Since I have been, and there's a, there's a number of really good questions which I'm gonna let you filter because you're, you're better at it than I. Um, but here's an opportunity to be optimistic. This is the first time in my life, and I suspect in all our lives, where you turn on the media and you see a president standing next to a scientist, where you see a prime minister standing next to a scientist, um, where the scientist is not just in the room, but at the podium. Um, and it's partly because the nature of this pandemic, um, our leaders know nothing, know no science, almost by definition. Um, so we have the first, first, we have several things. We have the first global crisis probably since 1940. Nothing like this has touched as many countries, indeed you can make a case, it's more global um, than was the World War. Mexico did, wasn't directly affected by the war. Mexico is affected by this crisis. So you've got a truly global crisis that governments really can't get in the way of. So we're all individually exposed. And indeed, what do we know so far the best remedy so far is what we're doing. None of us are together. Social distancing, which gives us, in a way, the control over the solution in ways that, that no other crisis has had. Um, but the fourth point, which is, which is, is the optimism. Um, suddenly, experts aren't just in the room. They're at the decision-making table. And even, even Donald Trump keeps on having to defer to the guy who actually knows what he's talking about, as opposed to the guys who have, who have no clue. Um, so if you're an optimist, you can say, hey, maybe 
in this, these decision-making processes in most countries, not all countries, in most countries. Um, we're bringing expertise back into the room uh, we're, we're inviting, not just inviting, we're demanding that the scientists solve this problem, that the, that the doctors solve this problem. Um, and given some of the other problems we need to address, uh, that could be sp a spectacular outcome if we can make it stick. One of the questions I'll jump ahead is about climate change. I spent part of this week with mm -hmm. talking to Christiana Figueres, um, who, as you remember, was one of the lead uh, negotiators at, at the Paris Agreement and continues to be very active in the climate movement. And she made that observation that suddenly scientists are in the room and, and they need to be in the room, the decision-making room. But even more than that, we all know that the pace at which we need to address climate has accelerated. Current best numbers are we got to cut carbon emissions in half between 2020 and 2030. We are already in arrears because it's March. Now, in fact, they've gone down because economies are shuttered. Um, but there's been no policy changes at all. Quite the opposite. China's actually starting up new coal plants um, a, a, as we speak. Um, but here we have a situation where governments have absorbed a lot of authority where they've decided that there's unlimited money available to solve problems. Again, Mexico is an exception. But if you look at the US and Europe together, so far we've identified and committed to spending something on the order of $10 trillion. 10 trillion is actually a big number. Um, it's a quarter of the total GNP of Europe and the states put together. I mean, we've committed to spending this not over 10 years, but over a couple of months. So there's a massive commitment to spend a massive amount of money. Um, and we've let scientists back in the room. And the question Christiana asks, which is the right question, what if we were smart enough to say, okay, we're gonna rebuild all these economies with all of this fabulous amount of money. What if at least some of that was tinged green? What if some of that went through retrofitting uh, infrastructures to make them zero carbon, or at least pointed in a zero carbon direction. Um, what if we use this unique moment in, in literally civilization to get ahead of the curve that we're so badly behind? Uh, point is, you could do it. Uh, the question is, will we do it? I'm afraid that uh, uh, the idea of going back to the situation before the crisis, maybe foremost in the mind of of politicians and the allocation of money may be uh, perhaps biased toward supporting industries that may have been affected permanently. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit less optimistic about the big government spending in the current situation. I see a lot of uh, opportunity for rent seeking, lobbying, um, uh, you know, money directed to industries that have been hit hard, but that will be hit hard perhaps permanently. Um, so, so uh, take, take the example of the Boeing company. Exactly. So here's a company that makes airplanes that have unfortunate habit of killing people. Um, the, 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 the plane that has been grounded now, which was their future on the commercial side. So Boeing, as you just suggested, has been very successful and got themselves a big chunk of this subsidy money. Um, so Boeing, which was a company that people that make airplanes should make airplanes that fly. That, 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 that's not a complicated, it is a complicated thing to do, but it's not a complicated ask from the point of view of, of a consumer. One could have imagined a world where the U.S. would say to Boeing, you make really good jet, you make really good military jets, and they make really good military equipment. Why don't we cut this company in half? And... Uh, that piece can live, and this piece has got to either learn how to make airplanes or die. Um, and rather than just throw money at you while you try to figure that out, you, you sort of got to do it yourself. But to your point, politics as usual is a deadly sin. Uh, politics as usual in the midst of the most unusual crisis any of us have ever seen is simply stupid. Uh, but you're right, it is far more likely that that is what we do. 
part of the problem in too many countries, we're in an election cycle. We have a Congress that is unable to legislate almost anything, but they were able to legislate a $2 trillion bailout in less than a week. Now, what are politicians, there's two things that politicians most like to do. One is get reelected, and the other is to spend money to get reelected. And we just handed the Congress literally, it's not even an unlimited checkbook because this is beyond imagination. $2 trillion is a lot of money. That's on top of a trillion dollar deficit and ahead of, as you know, because you're sitting in Washington, new discussions about another half trillion to a trillion or some kind of number. Um, it's monopoly money um, and it's monopoly money in Europe as well. Smaller governments are only spending a half trillion um, at, at the EU level, but at the national levels, they're spending many trillions. Um, the question is, will civil society, the people on this, in, 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 the, in this room, um, ETAM, other, other institutions simply say, yeah, well, that's what they do. Nothing we can do about it. If we do, we deserve the future we get. And I'm afraid, because I agree with you, the most likely outcome is the status quo ante. Um, but the status quo ante was a little healthier, but it was, was healthy in terms of none of us had coronavirus, but it wasn't terribly healthy in terms of almost any other dimension any of us can imagine. What are we gonna do about it is the question. Uh, if we wait for Godot, we know how that book ends. Godot never shows up. And, and we will have both wasted a great crisis, but have dug ourselves into a hole that is going to be very difficult uh, to dig out of. Perhaps uh, to, to kind of close the circle to the initial point made by Alejandro, uh, the current situation may lead in two different directions. One positive direction, you know, we take up the challenge, we improve our institutions, and uh, we move to our better coordination and, and governance, or, or we move in the opposite direction to nationalism, xenophobia, closing borders. Um, uh, so I'm a great, I have this great fear that uh, people are going to, so, uh, and you can see it, people, um, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of free trade. I think uh, trade is communication. It's, uh, trade is the way we converse and, and how we keep peace. And uh, I, I'm afraid that the current situation is going to lead to um, voices that, that kind of uh, uh, blame on, on free trade and, and free movement of um, goods and, and to some extent people and ideas. Uh, the current crisis. So how do we defeat parochial thinking right now? How can, how can we, um, in this dire situation where it make, seems to make sense to put barriers, to stop people, to, you know, to hunker down and look inside, how do we um, tell people that's not, that there is no future? Cesar, I've got bad news. That's all right. That, that, that horse has left the barn. Globalization, the hyper-globalization of the 90s and the aughts is finished. Uh, we've been watching, as you know, global trade has been, had been growing much more slowly than global growth. We've become less globally intensive, uh, trade intensive. Uh, then we had the start of the trade wars, which everyone blames on Trump. They don't notice the European trade wars, uh, the investment constraints that people had been putting up. And this, this, is, this is us because we do, we do it more spectacularly than anyone else. Uh, but take a look at, at the Germans, the French, uh, the British, the Italians, uh, take a look at the Asians. So globalization, that chapter is finished. That's not to say that tomorrow you're going to move to a completely nation-based world, uh, but this crisis has been fascinating to watch. I said earlier, the Security Council doesn't seem to think this is an important issue because they're not meeting on it. Um, fascinating. We're in the middle of the opportunity that Christiana Figueres describes and what's the decision the UN makes? To postpone COP26 to next year, to later, because we can't put people together. Instead of thinking, how do we take this opportunity and do something with it? Um, 
institution after institution has failed us at the global level. Uh, the Secretary General is almost non is almost invisible. Uh, never mind the Pope. Never mind other supposed global leaders. Um, so we're moving rapidly into a world where who do you trust? And that's what happens with fear. You trust yourself, you trust your circle, you trust whatever that lowest denominator is, that's a nation state. Um, but it was already starting to happen and technology was gonna get us there anyhow. No, no businessman in his right mind today, of today, three months ago, was building a global supply chain. She was trying to figure out how do I bring that supply chain as close to the market as possible? And technology was letting her do that. Uh, we've seen the reshoring, not just because we, we don't like the Chinese or the Chinese don't like us, but because the economics that drove those global supply chains don't exist anymore. Uh, first, they don't exist because the labor intensity of most production has collapsed. So why would you make something in, um, pick a country, in Vietnam? If the labor is cheaper than it is in Mexico, it makes no sense anymore because the labor component of most manufacturing and most services, by the way, it, it is dropping dramatically. Second, robots have gotten a lot smarter. They work 24 hours a day. We can clearly see whole sectors of the economy shifting over. In, indeed, what is social distancing gonna do? McDonald's already has the technology to run a McDonald's store with one person. In most cases, they haven't implemented, they have in Japan, because not a lot of people want to work in McDonald's. They have in Arizona, because it's mostly old people, they don't want to work there. If you're running a McDonald's today, okay, this is, this is easy. You don't have to deal with all this health stuff. You don't have to worry about your employees. Um, and people will be safe because they're not dealing with employees. You're gonna see a dramatic acceleration of, of adoption of robots, which means more nationalization. Now the question on the table, and this is a question for Mexico. Mexico has missed this opportunity. It, it's, it's stunning how Mexico has missed this opportunity. Here's a world where you can feel the supply chains shifting from efficiency-driven supply chains to resilience, resiliency-driven supply chains. That means you want resilient supply chains near your market. We're the market. You're the near. This was Mexico's opportunity, not just, and it's not just the USMCA because that is important, but it's a necessary, not sufficient condition. It's about education. It's about the facilities. It's about services. Um, it's about the integration of, of, of modern infrastructure. Um, and it's about the Mexican authorities saying, we actually want the private sector to come to Mexico and invest. Um, and, and unfortunately, most of the signals have been, have been interpreted. Maybe they've not been intended. They've been interpreted to the contrary. Um, so I don't think we go back to globalization as we thought it would be a couple years ago. I think we're going to some place really quite different. I think there are winning national strategies. I think there are winning corporate strategies. I think there are winning human strategies that could be adopted. Um, in the middle of a crisis, you're unlikely to do it. But... I don't see a lot of thinking, neither in my country nor your country, about how do, we, how do we live in this world? How do we prosper in this world? Last point. I was trained as an economist a long, long time ago. One of the articles of faith, of course, and I'm sure you teach it at ETAM, is that autarky is the second best. Global tra trade is good, non-trade is bad. Autarky is a bad thing. It's simply wrong. It's based, on a the, it's, it's based on a different distribution of labor that doesn't exist anymore. Um, or rather, it's wrong for big swaths of the economy. Fact of the matter is, North America can prosper, not just exist, prosper. People, natural resources, food security, uh, great universities, uh, well-educated, good workers, you name it. In fact, there's a first best solution available, not a second best, a first best. We have to, we need new leaders, we need new thinking, uh, we need to reorder, reorganize what kind of world we want and realize that what worked from 1948 to 19, to 2020, it was, it was a really nice run, but it's over, so we've got to do something different.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. I'm not sure if we should take... Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Alan, before, before we close, I, I, uh, I, I want to ask you something else. Um, about two years ago or so, uh, I heard you speak about um, what was going on in the world. This is pre-COVID. And the, the big issue was China and the US. And the, as you mentioned back then, which I mean, it, it made a big impact on myself, was, was uh, this is a commercial war? This is, this is something else. This has to be with two powers uh, which are you know, sharing, sharing a new world. Uh, has, has any of your, your way of thinking about this issue changed with COVID? What's going to happen afterwards? After all, this originated in China. You know, uh, what can we expect for the future? Um, we are incapable of sustaining, of, of negotiating a new global order at this point. Um, that, my guess is that the tension, the competition between the Americans and the Chinese will only intensify. It is, it is about Trump and it is about Xi, but it's far more fundamentally about perception of national interests and the two countries don't perceive their national, they perceive their national interest, I think, in a zero-sum way. Um, the Chinese, in my judgment, which is what I hope I said two years ago, um, are looking for a world that is organized differently than the one that, as they've come to prominence, they're inheriting. They don't like a world that was designed in 1948 by the Europeans and the Americans. Uh, the Russians were at the table, but they didn't really have a vote. Uh, but it was essentially British and the Americans that defined that post-war period, post-war order. The Japanese were added eventually. Chinese are saying, that's an interesting world, but that's not, a, we, we, we're not trying to get at, into your world. We're inviting you to negotiate a new world with us. We don't want to do it. Uh, and they don't want to come into, into this world in, in a way. So, yes, I think that fundamental competition. The question's going to be what, hap what happens to other not so great powers. Um, Russia, if it didn't have nuclear weapons, no one would ever mention the word. It's an economy smaller than Italy uh, and getting smaller fast because they don't make anything anybody wants other than natural resources. Um, and we may not need their natural resources in the economies in, in the world of the future. Uh, the Europeans have systematically failed to define what Europe is. They're, they're, they're losing a great crisis. Imagine a world where Italy has horrible coronavirus and they appeal to their neighbors, send us personal protection equipment. And what do their neighbors do? They close the borders in direct contravention of the European charters. They close, the Germans close the border, as do the, their other neighbors, and say, oh no, it's too scary. We, if we have masks and gowns, we're going to need them for Germans because there's no such thing as a European. So that experiment, if, the, if you didn't think Europe had failed, we now know Europe, the EU, has failed. Um, the only question is, how does it come apart, it seems? So they're not a great power. They can't be a great power. Uh, what does Mexico do in that world? Um, I think it's real obvious. Geography actually matters. Um, Mexico is going to have to, even if the Americans are too damn dumb to understand it, figure out how do you design a world where we can all prosper together because geography matters at the end of the day. Um, if, if I can just have a second, I, I know you, you want to wrap up in the next minute. Um, a bunch of people that are on, uh, on the call did answer the, the, the survey, and I thought I would share some of the results. The first question is, how much confidence do you have in these various people? Um, the, you have the most confidence in scientists, uh, followed by business CEOs and journalists, and the least confidence in uh, whoever your president or prime minister happens to be. And indeed, 70% of the people on the call said they have no confidence whatsoever uh, in your president or prime minister. And since I'm assuming you're not all Mexicans, that, that may include some others. Um, how much confidence do you think citizens of your country have in their national government to act in the people's interest? 
55% said not too much, 20% said none at all. Almost 80% of you said, we don't think the government acts in the interest of the people, which is pretty amazing. And then why? Corrupt politicians, 81%. Weak leaders, 63%, and everything else is, is, is small. Um, And, and this is a challenge, I think, for Etam. How hard is it for you to tell the difference between what is true and what is false when it comes to national or societal issues? 53% um, said difficult, 11% said very difficult. Almost two thirds of the people are having, of, of these people, well-educated, well-trained, um, interested in issues, are having trouble telling in, in American terms, fake news from real news. Um, that's a challenge for the educational system, I think. Um, the good news, do you trust most of the people you come into daily contact with? Overwhelmingly, 60%, 65% say, I mostly trust them or I always trust them. So what, what's that say? Two thirds of you trust most people, and most of you don't trust your politicians. Um, but you do trust scientists, you do trust journalists, you do trust business leaders. Um, I'm not sure what you want to do with that, but if I were running a great institution, um, I could imagine some things I might do in terms of in terms of the curriculum. Yeah, thanks for sharing this this number, Helen. So, I mean, given given this point of uh, lack of leadership that that is revealed in this survey, why don't you? Just give us a pitch for the uh, Talberg uh, Eliasson Award. So th thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your support on that over the last couple of years. Uh, several years ago, I found that I was in too many conversations, usually over dinner and usually over an awful lot of good wine, that more or less ended up a bit like some of the issues we've talked about, but, but ended up saying, what's wrong in the world today is there are no leaders. And I would go home and recover and I'd say, well, everybody seems to think that, but I think they're thinking about political leaders because I'm pretty sure there are great business leaders and great religious leaders and great NGO leaders and even some great political leaders. Um, so maybe we ought to use the Telberg Foundation as a platform to test the proposition. Um, are there great leaders uh, out there? And so we started something that is now called the Telberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. And we decided that unlike most of these things, we wouldn't just gather a small group of people in a room and say, well, who do you know that's a great leader? And then give them a prize. And we certainly wouldn't just give it to somebody who's at the end of their career and is almost dead because that great prize wouldn't have any consequence. Instead, we would design an open online platform that anyone anywhere in the world can nominate someone that they think is a great leader. We deliberately didn't define what leadership is because I don't think you can, but we did say we're looking for leaders who are courageous, who are innovative, uh, who take risks where risks make sense, uh, who are global in their, in their mindset, and whose leadership is value-based. And we asked people to nominate, and then we did put together a, um, a jury that selects. And over the last five or six years, we have selected some phenomenal leaders. Um, I know that you shared the website, so you can go look at them, but these have been scientists, they've been religious people, um, they have been people like Christiana Figueres, whose accomplishment was not to worry about, about climate, but to figure out a new kind of diplomacy that produced a different kind of agreement. Uh, we honored a, a neuroscientist who's done amazing work in his laboratory, but far more important is figured out that neural rights and our neural identities need to be protected in the future and is trying to develop ways to do that. So uh, that, 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 that's, the, that's the ad. We're looking for great leaders. We're looking for you to nominate great leaders. Uh, we've sent you, I think you sent the, um, the website. It, it's Telberg, Telberg Eliasson, uh, globalleadership.org. 
um, and we can send it around to the participants, nominate a leader, do it by the end of the month, um, and, and then by the end of the year, we'll have found a great leader, and, or great leaders. Uh, last point, we have failed to find any great politicians. Some have actually made it into the quarterfinals, but no one has made it into the finals. And that's not for want of trying, I think it's rather for who's, who's, who's out there. But what we did discover is that although they don't call themselves politicians, everybody we've honored, whether it's a scientist, whether it's a, a human rights advocate, whether it's a public prosecutor, they're all doing politics. They don't get paid for it, but they're doing politics. They're trying to change policy and trying to change things for the better. And in fact, I think that's probably where the optimism has to lie. Not that we're sudden, our politicians will suddenly, like Paul on the road to Damascus, have this moment where they become, they become conscious of what they ought to be doing, but rather that other leaders in other places will increasingly grasp the nettle and, and, and do what they can do to make this world a better place. And, and in that context, again, a compliment to Etam, I think that's why you guys exist is to try to build leaders like that. So I hope some of them are nominated this year. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Cesar. This has been a, a fantastic conversation, truly stimulating, great ideas, great point of view. So now I'm really on behalf of all the ETAM community, I want to thank you deeply for spending this evening with us. Thank you very much. Eh, y a todos nuestros participantes les agradezco mucho el haber estado con nosotros y los invito el próximo lunes tendremos eh, nuestra siguiente charla que será sobre el tema del rol que deben de jugar los mercados financieros durante esta emergencia y en la construcción de la recuperación. Así que será a la misma hora, a las 5 de la tarde, con eh, eh, miembros muy, muy sobresalientes del sector financiero. Los esperamos a todos. And thank you very much for, to everyone and uh, goodbye. Gracias a todos. Hasta luego. And, and wash your hands. <laughs>